So hello everyone and good morning, good evening or good afternoon. So it's my great honor to introduce the speaker for today. And this is also the first time for me as a graduate student to invite speakers to our forum. So it's really wonderful for me. So uh, uh, Dr. Jodi Sun Yu Zhou is a senior lecturer in modern African and global history at the Department of History of Fudan University, China, and research fellow of the International Studies Group, University of Free State, South Africa. She holds a master's degree in African studies and a doctor of philosophy in history from the University of Oxford. Her research interests are modern African history, Cold War history, and China-African relations. Her first monograph entitled Kenya's and Zambia's Relations with China 1949 to 2019 was just published by James Curry in January 2023. She is also an executive board member of the Chinese in Africa and Africans in Chinese Research Network. So I would like to now uh, uh, give the floor to Dr. Jody. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, it's been really long since I have got this opportunity to present my work to the people on uh, the other side of the globe and everywhere, basically. So uh, I'm quite energetic and look forward to uh, interesting discussions later on. And also thanks for the uh, introduction. Very kindly uh, that I've got this opportunity to share one of my latest publication. Um, and today, actually, I'm uh, quite happy to have my two co-authors present for, for today's talk. The work was published just recently by the journal Interventions and talk about a uh, Afro-Asian travelogues uh, in the early 1960s. And this is particularly the kind of uh, scholarly work that I'm going to share today. Uh, and uh, the, my two co-authors uh, have to give credits to them, which are really great team. Uh, we had the, an enjoyable time working together, uh, who are Dr. Uh, Ming Qingyuan from uh, University of Alangun, uh, Nuremb uh, Nuremberg, forgive my German pronunciation. Um, and she, uh, we also have uh, Li Fang Zhang from uh, Rose University of South Africa. And uh, they, you can see that we all kind of uh, enrolled in very different kind of disciplinary backgrounds. And it's the first time I collaborate with people from very different like cult cultural studies, literature, art history, and so on. So it's kind of uh, an innovative um, project uh, for it to get started in the first place. And then how, how we get onto this project? Well, I have been always been intrigued by uh, the concept or the idea about third world, right, for a long time. And it's been always been there for my research work. Um, and of course, we all know the, the concept about the, what uh, famous scholar Vijay Prashad called the third world project that particularly emerged from that conference uh, in Bandung. And it got started interestingly that um, there are lots of things going on after that particular meeting, right? I just listed just a few, uh, the things that, you know, a lot of things happened uh, in the uh, mid 1950s and 60s, like all those uh, conferences that involve different types of uh, social groups, solidarity conference, writers meeting, a women's conference, and even journalists, uh, artists, and so on. And this platform actually allowed quite a privileged a group of people uh, to travel uh, between uh, Africa uh, and China. So uh, it, it is indeed a kind of um, a transcontinental uh, adventurers uh, at the time. And in this particular case, we're looking at uh, three authors and their respective work in that regard that recorded their in, uh, encounters as well as the travel uh, in uh, different African countries. And they are from the left to right, Feng Zhidan's glimpse into West Africa, du, Xuan, du Xuan's work, uh, West Africa Diary, and then Han Beiping, uh, Night in Africa. You'll see the publication dates are quite close. And I will explain uh, later in terms of why these pu publications like emerge in that particular uh, year range and so on. Well, on the other hand, we also um, witness uh, other uh, sort of works produced by African uh, uh, writers, particularly in this context, we would like to see the interactions between a particular writer from Mali. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about him, um, Mamado Gologo. But then this is a particular uh, travelogue that we're analyzing is called uh, China, a great people, great destiny. And there's a French uh, version of it as well, uh, both published uh, in 1965. So the years of publication actually quite close. And we're just uh, interested in the kind of intersections between these tasks. Are there any 
encounters any kind of uh, hundred rules right between these authors when they travel and take advantages of these Afro-Asian uh, meetings and, and so on. And exactly that got us into the idea of writing uh, the stories uh, exactly to understand the sort of less formal Afro-Asian interactions. So we're not in this context looking at formal meetings in the conference halls, uh, but also the travels they undertook uh, before and after these meetings in a way to understand better the kind of complexity of Afro-Asian solidarity. And secondly, of course, is to examine those interactions in a way to uh, use the lived experiences and the first-hand uh, accounts because they write a lot of details, the things that won't usually appear in uh, state official uh, sort of archives, then in a way to offer maybe fresh insights into transnational networks uh, in the early 1960s. So we entered into this sort of field with those questions uh, uh, in mind. Of course, there are lots of um, uh, recent publications uh, uh, with that regard, and I don't want to list them all, but there's several interesting things that uh, probably would like to I would like to just uh, introduce, and particularly this one by Afro Asian Networks Research Collective. Uh, they not only uh, had a great team in producing a lot of papers and conferences and so on, but they had a database, which I would like to show just the idea in terms of how in the future, probably this research could be developed into as something to give you a sense about this kind of visual uh, idea, how these networks were uh, built up and then formulated it and probably even negotiated. And this is just the kind of idea uh, in terms of a lot of uh, connections between these people, actually. They traveled back and forth and to different, uh, they undertook different routes and so on. So it's quite a complex. Uh, sort of um, uh, journey in that sense. And in, in that way, a kind of touch upon the idea about crossing, right? So on the map, you point from one point to the other, you, you make, a, make a line there. So make connections in that way on a map. And exactly this is the kind of travel uh, that people undertook at the time is they had to flip uh, they had to fly all the time and even transit, a lot of transit in different places and so on. So physically, uh, it's it's a crossing, but also other kind of uh, meanings to that word. And then the papers really like um, uh, get started with the question in mind is to use to take advantage of the disciplinary diversities of of us to regard and analyze travel logs not only as historical archives but also literary writing. So. As a historian, I would always try to ask this question is how sources were collected and how valid uh, these writings are, I mean, in the sense that they can be qualified as archives. And for literature background people, they might ask very different questions in terms of the idea about fictionality uh, and a lot of uh, types of genres of writing and so on. So we try to do this kind of innovative way of, can we, you know, uh, examine these uh, uh, texts uh, that, uh, you know, to build up that kind of connections, both archives and, and literary works and so on. And of course, by, uh, uh, by doing that, we also try to analyze uh, Afro-Asian travelogues and the circulation channels to understand the sort of third world internationalist nationalists. So in a way that um, it's about solidarity that went across different national boundaries. And also there are some ambiguous uh, boundaries, right? We recognize it, it sometimes in su some extent of ambiguity contained, but also we try to understand the kind of space uh, interconnecting nation states and individuals. So the idea of crossing again is quite uh, crucial there. And there are other people who have used concepts such as Cold War crossings in the context of transnational travel and interactions, for example, across the Soviet bloc uh, to explore the effect of the cross-world exchanges of people, technologies, and culture. And here in this essay, we try to bring uh, and propose uh, something called a third world cosmopolitanism that also crosses national boundaries. And again, the Cold War binary uh, too. And to achieve that, we propose a framework of understanding this third world crossing. So uh, firstly, uh, you know, it's quite obvious as a show on the map is there lots of physical uh, travels that uh, were, were, were taking place at the time that went across large geographical uh, distances. 
but also on the textual level that travel logs produced emotional bonds of shared anti-colonial and anti-imperialist sentiments and manifested the ambiguity of Afro-Asianism often through silences, absences, and discordance within and among uh, these texts too. And the, finally, we're also interested in the circulation of these texts that there was a Afro-Asian Republic of Lettuce built by national and as well as transnational print networks through which transcontinental solidarity could be read, seen, and felt. And above all, we try to, of course, adopt the concept as something like a, a methodological uh, intervention and examines cross-border experiences of different Afro-Asian actors, pasts, and print networks jointly in light of the connectedness. And by reading them crossingly, the essay also trying to uh, argue that uh, travelogs enrich official archives of Afro-Asian connections and bring out the nuances in state-driven narratives, emphasizing the human connection inherent in Afro-Asian solidarity, felt through individual encounters and sometimes fragile uh, emotional bounds. So what about the physical travel, right? So uh, we try to look at two particular destinations and one is Beijing, the capital of the uh, People's Republic of China. The other was Bamako, uh, the capital city of the uh, Republic of Mali. Well, these two countries' relationship uh, got started as soon as Mali got independence in 1960. And this is, it's a relatively small country and liter uh, literacy rate was also quite low. It's only uh, 3%. So upon independence, the country itself struggled to develop its national economy independent of the metropole. And by 1962, having withdrawn first from the French community and then the Franc Zone, Mali turned to the communist bloc for economic aid and assistance. And it was also uh, from the perspective of Beijing that trying to take this opportunity, especially aid program uh, in Mali, to forward its global struggles against revisionists and so-called uh, imperialists. And in September 1961, you can see just one year after uh, the two countries established official relations, uh, the economic and technical cooperation treaty was, uh, was signed and under which Chinese specialists were dispatched to teach irrigation and rice planting uh, in Mali. While Malian President Kaita, Madibo Kaita, favors of China's aid was undeniably influenced by China-US geopolitical tension, his affinity for China was not entirely pragmatic, rather it had some deeper and cultural uh, social uh, reasons. For example, at that time, also uh, Gologo, the writer of the book, um, it was also worked as the Malian uh, government, right? And appointed as minister, really. Uh, he was, also of, uh, of course, plays a very crucial role in facilitating his country's amity with a model uh, socialist country. He was also theoretician of the ruling party, which had officially adopted socialism since 1962. Yet state records mainly refer to him as a senior politician of Mali, which makes his travelogue a unique channel for understanding the less known stories of Afro-Asian uh, cultural uh, interactions. In the early 1960s, Mali was among those African countries that initiated state-led top-down socialist experiments in Africa, which drove Qaeda's government even closer to Beijing. This thing from Marxist class-based analytic approaches to socialism, Non-Western socialists share the challenge of either asserting the traditional culture as constituting an indigenous socialism or translating global socialisms into local lexicons. Like most of the early advocates of African socialism, Kaida was an outspoken pan-Africanist and his belief in the true worth of Africa was expressed through a conception of the universal civilization. To quote him directly, we believe willingly and in all good faith in universal civilization. For us Africans, it represents the sum total of the contributions of all civilizations. We do not consider it the prerogative of a single continent, even less of a single country or a single group of countries." Unquote. And the emphasis on a very much clear collective rather than a nationalist identity also found way into Gologo's own writing. 
And he also wrote his, his hopes that my African readers would realize that a common destiny uh, existed actually with China. If his self-representation was pan-Africanist in nature, his characterization of China's position as larger than a country was probably little more than uh, romanticization. And to quote him, China is more than a country, she is a continent. I have said this before and I shall say it again. I do not say this to make people afraid of China, far from it. I say primarily so that no one need fear a people of this caliber and power who works as well with wooden abacus as with electronic computers of their own making, unquote. And for Malian leaders, China represented an alternative path of national development and socialist construction that could lift the countries out of post-colonial challenges. Mali's pre-colonial past was also valorized in service of modern nation building in the aftermath of independence. A lineal descendant of Sudiara Kaita, a legendary emperor of the 13th century, Maribo Kaida was equally dedicated to restoring the glorious empires of the Mali culture of earlier centuries. Political virtues such as unity of people, thanks to the existence of a single party, happiness of each through the work of all, and vice versa, and a single objective, economic independence, laid the essential foundation of the Republic of Mali. At the same time, uh, sorry, at the time, similar virtues were also being advocated by other African leaders like Kenneth Kaunda and Julius Nyerere. But Mali stood out for quite a strongly linear understanding of history. An ongoing anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggles were depicted as continuations of local resistance during early uh, colonial rule. And of course, if you see that from the perspective of China, we found out something similar is the idea about this Marxist-Leninist teleological view of history. And according to that view particularly, all societies would develop from one stage to another until they ultimately culminate uh, in communism. And this helps actually explain the critical assessment of ancient civilizations in the Chinese travelogues about Africa in the 1960s. To Han Beiping, Egyptian pyramids represented the loss of royal power, the construction of which had cost endless human lives in the first place. He asked, how did ancient Egyptian civilization end and why was modern Egypt destroyed? Not intending to address the question, he actually believed that his readers, presumably Chinese, would give an immediate answer to the question. Again, European colonialism and imperialism were to be blamed. In Feng Zhidan's glimpses into West Africa, the connection between Africa and Imperial China is dated back to as early as the 10th century and became even closer in the 19th century as a result of the shared miseries. And this shared victimhood and comradeship between Africa and China was critical to the emotional bonds of Afro-Asian uh, solidarity. Feng Zhidan was in Africa twice. Uh, he was depicted on the left. And following his first visit to Egypt, uh, Sudan, and Ethiopia in 1956, he traveled to West Africa in 61 on behalf of the Chinese African People's Friendship Association. Representing the Chinese Right Association, Han Beiping and Du Xuan uh, in the middle and right, attended the second Afro-Asian Writers Conference in Cairo uh, in February uh, 62, and then traveled together to North and West African countries. And these three writers actually, I argued, belong to a particular group of people, the Chinese intellectuals who grew up in the first half of the 20th century and often termed so-called uh, century of humiliation. They saw the country under siege and this had a lot of impact on their writings too. The political infiltration, economic exploitation, military invasion by Western imperialism were believed to be the cause of the destruction of China's splendid civilization. And this created historical, historical memory of enormous humiliation, which still resonates uh, powerfully today. And those writers' narrations of Africa and its people were also inseparable from their own life trajectories. Both Du Xuan and Han Beiping had extensive uh, experience undertaking revolutionary activities, and from 1949 were appointed to several key posts related to culture and arts, including the Afro-Asian Writers Bureau. 
And Feng Zhidan, uh, who, was, who was relatively younger, um, graduated from prestigious universities and started his career of journalism with the People's Daily after the establishment of the PRC. And these three writers might not have held senior leadership positions in the Chinese government as Gologo did in the Malian government, but their political and social networks interse uh, intersected. For example, both Du Xuan and Han Beiping wrote about the meeting with the Secretary of State for Information on the second day of their arrival in Bamoko. And uh, they also had conversations and so on. Although they did not mention the name, actually, the Secretary of State for Information in Mali was actually Mamado Gologo. And here we go, we have um, a, a very cru crucial figure that was relatively uh, last mentioned in the literature who was uh, Gologo. He left Bamoko for Beijing uh, in November 1963 by way of Jakarta, where he first took part in the second conference of the Secretariat of the Afro-Asian Journalists Association. And he also arrived uh, at the time with the president of uh, uh, Japanese Journalist Association. And this again proved that the invitation was facilitated through Afro-Asian networks. And Gologo's travels in China lasted about one month. And other than the capital and government buildings, he also went to uh, Guangdong and Hunan, Hubei, Shanghai, Zhejiang, and other sort of destinations like historical sites, museums, factories, uh, botanical gardens, and even people's communes and other places. And we actually discovered him as a quite uh, interesting, uh, unique uh, figure, but uh, his name was relatively unknown. He received mainly education, early education in medicine, and initially even worked for a number of military and civil administration in West Africa, until he became involved in the politics later on, uh, especially the then uh, uh, leading party, uh, Union uh, uh, Sudanese, a branch of the pan-French West African political organ, uh, RDA, uh, and which created actually in uh, 46. And Gologo's political capacity was demonstrated in his various roles in the colonial administration, including uh, Ministry of Public Health and Information Services too. And by 61, after the Republic of Mali gaining independence, and then the RDA became the ruling party, Gologo was named the Secretary of State for Information and Tourism and director of the national US RDA newspaper, La Serre. And this is a particularly interesting uh, role that he played for this newspaper because a lot of uh, uh, back and forth uh, uh, connections were formed between Lessa and um, uh, People's Daily too. Uh, he was, of course, also worked as the president of National Union of Journalists in Mali. So that's why he got involved into uh, uh, literature as well. And his intellectual pursuits, political service, and creative endeavors reach beyond to include journalism literature, although he was not trained in either discipline. And his first collection of poetry, Mongar et en Volcan, uh, which was translated in English as My Heart is a Volcano, was released in Moscow in 1961, followed two years later by his first novel, Le Hesquiba de Lassilos, The Survivor of Ethios, published by in Paris by Présence Africana. And both works intended to disseminate his political ideologies and philosophical perspectives to local and international readers. And his also writings appeared in uh, publications, for example, the Afro-Asian Journalist, which was a monthly magazine produced by AJA. Uh, it was also through this particular channel that Gologo crossed path with these uh, Chinese writers we just talked about. The literary writing of Gologo and Chinese writers' traveling experiences captured the dynamic crossings of the third world uh, in the 1960s. So having talked about their physical travels, we now enter the second uh, frame, uh, layer of the framework, which was the crossings in texts. According to Charles Laughlin, he, uh, travel writing has been used as a lens for Chinese self-imagination, uh, uh, self-imagining in the world context. And instead of focusing on China and the literary traditions, we actually read the texts by authors who traveled in the third world in relation uh, to one another. And we believe that these works construct a so-called imagined community on a textual level based on anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism with an emphasis on personal uh, experiences. And the first person point of view in travelogues fo forces readers to follow the narrative from the author's per perspective, 
While the genre itself paradoxically gives credibility to the accounts, authenticity, even though nuances and incongruences exist between and behind lines, and intentionally or unintentionally inten leaked personal notes and comments complicate the state-driven narratives of Afro-Asian solidarity. Uh, in, and in this sense, it also seconds what we think uh, is uh, Julian uh, Spa's idea of contextualizing the autonomy of writers and literature. On the one hand, post-colonial states tend to use Afro-Asian travelogues to construct a community protesting colonialism and imperialism within the third world. On the other hand, moments of silences and ambiguity in the text confirmed autonomy of the writers and literature despite heavy traces of state uh, ideologies. So what are uh, the kind of key narratives of these writings? We found out uh, above all sentiments of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism. For example, there are lots of uh, mentioning uh, uh, from Han and Du's account about a middle-aged white man they encountered on the plane and Han described him as someone suspicious, and then do described uh, so so called this last generation of uh, colonialism, and there are also uh, stories about two African friends sitting next to him uh, secretly uh, ch chatting with the white man and so on. Though they remember the white man as the last colonial governor of Guinea and the last French governor of Mali, respectively, his real name cannot really be identified. We try to do that, but actually. I, we think it doesn't really matter because his image mainly say serve uh, as a symbol of fading colonial rule in Africa in these texts. And there was also example, uh, for example, uh, in the city of Shanghai chapter in Gologo's writing, he gave a brief history of foreign concessions, which were states within a state occupied and ruled by the British, the American and the French with so many colonialism and abuses in the, uh, in the same place. And Glogo heard stories, for example, about the misery of a Chinese girl assaulted by some American soldiers in Shanghai. And he recalled that, quote, the same thing happened in Dakar in 1946 when the region of Bagni and then of Yof uh, were lent to the US Air Force, unquote. And in Feng Zhidan's essay too, he condemned the cruelty of forced labor by French colonialists. Many Chinese and later African indentured workers recruited by French colonialists died of heavy labor and poor living conditions. And the narratives of experiences people had under colonial rule laid the foundation for writers' connection and emotional bond with the place and the people uh, they visited. And despite the uh, very strong uh, motives of anti-imperialist and uh, anti-colonialist uh, motivations, we also see the emphasis was uh, slightly different. Um, for example, there's some uh, a lot of talking in terms of Gologo's account uh, about socialist construction, and these are just some uh, visual representations of his visits. He documented in a lot of detail about his visit to factories, communes, and also, uh, in addition to the history of construction, uh, production, and management of these institutions, he also paid uh, uh, paid closer re uh, closer attention to the living conditions and social welfare of the people, such as housing, health healthcare, education, and using these information with uh, you know he obtained from interviews with local workers and so on. And with a linear historical view, Gologo clearly located Mali in the development trajectory, modeling Chinese socialist construction, with Mali at the initial stage as opposed to China in the state of full operation and viability. And romanticizing China was therefore a politically and historically conscious decision to legitimize Mali's socialist engineering. Meanwhile, rather than just focusing on economic construction, also there are lots of mentioning about culture, uh, which was quite integral to China's socialist nation building. For example, he viewed Chinese culture as a so-called realist culture, contributing to the economic productivity and education, and there are lots of other examples too. And Han Du wrote little uh, on, uh, on the contrary about material construction and modern development Mali, Rather, they focus more on the colonial and anti-colonial history of the local landscape. Again, I provided some of the snapshots of the, of the book's uh, photos, the visual representation. 
and there are lots of details uh, in terms of their discussion about awakening of African people and Malian resistance against colonialists when they pass through ancient battlefields and so on. What is paradoxical is that when describing the brutality of combat, Han quoted from the book, um, which was by uh, a French historian, and only reference, uh, this was the only reference in his travelogue. And translated into Chinese in 1960, this particular work called Afrique Noire was among the few publications on Africa at that time. And despite direct interactions, books about Africa in China were mostly translated from the Soviet Union or Western Europe during this period. And they also, uh, uh, they're also real restoration of Africa's cultural tradition as crucial to the continuation of local anti-colonial resistance after independence. And they also talk about local literary and artistic traditions too. For example, he, uh, you know, cited uh, an entitled poem about Malian King translated across three languages to show the talent and wisdom of West Africa. And Han praised the cultural and artistic value of local oral traditions, which were rendered unfamiliar to Chinese people by the colonizer constructed barriers. And putting African culture and literature into three phases, according to Africa's encounter with colonialism, Han pointed out significance of cultural restoration in the third phase of independence and regarded cultural exchange as a way of undoing uh, colonial uh, influences. There are also a lot of writers mentioning about personal identity and uh, involvement in state affairs that might partially account for the different focuses on state, uh, on nation building projects and culture. For example, it's clearly that Gologo held a senior position in the government, meanwhile, Han and Du are mainly their careers in uh, literature. There are lots of nuances actually in these uh, so-called state-driven narratives of solidarity. For example, there was one episode in terms of uh, the two authors, they slept uh, the share like one night uh, in the house of the mayor of Sun uh, in the Segu region. Uh, the, one of the authors, Han, he attributed his slipness to his thoughts. Uh, and incitement about Malian people's history of struggle. Meanwhile, in Han's, uh, in Du's diary, he wrote that he was just troubled by mosquitoes. And the different narratives of the same events demonstrate the different perspectives, personalities, and relationships with the state. And another example is with uh, their meeting uh, with the mayor of Bandiagara, who showed them a silk woven picture of Tiananmen. Meanwhile, Du only mentioned that this picture hung out on the wall of the living room was a gift of China's trade mission last year. And Han Kevin narrated his discovery of the two frames in, at a remote uh, corner, which was then presented by the mayor with a smile that could only appear when someone's showing the most uh, precious uh, treasure. And there are lots of uh, interesting uh, anecdotes. Uh, if you're interested, you feel free to, uh, to, to, to uh, check the uh, original article. There's one particular controversy that I would like to highlight uh, in their writing. It's particular uh, a poem uh, which was cited by a six-year-old girl uh, in a kindergarten in Gologo's writing. Uh, I won't read it because the text was there and it's quite blunt uh, in a way that Gologo put the com uh, put just one writing about this poem that oh no comment. So he actually avoided uh, uh, making any direct comment uh, in, in this poem. Of course, the poem was cited, uh, uh, sorry, it was um, uh, told in, in, in Mandarin Chinese and then got translated to him. And the original task in Chinese cannot be traced. Thus, it is difficult to identify the messages that might be added or lost in the translation process. However, there was a very clearly lack of racial sensitivity. Even though the song was sung by a little girl and might have been intended to address another child, the word little is quite problematic, positioning China as a patronizing older brother. The militant tone of boom and breaking also revealed a more radical understanding of social uh, transformation and decolonization. And Gologo's no comments exactly exist, uh, exhibited his rejection of and reservations about further engagements with the performance but he followed it with immediate praise of Chinese education on Afro-Asian friendship from an early age. 
And uh, there are lots of recent work actually talking about this racial uh, insensitivity between China and Africa in the Cold War by uh, scholars like Chang or Mahla. And these low, loud narratives of Afro-Asian solidarity in task did not eliminate the moments, uh, disagreements, confusion, and misunderstanding every day of encounters. The silence between the lines to some extent manifested a failed conversation on the issue of race, as well as fragile and unstable Afro-Asian solidarity. So after talking about both the physical travel and the, uh, uh, the, the text themselves, we will now enter the third layer of this framework is about publishing and circulating these literature. And there are two existing uh, kind of uh, types of studies or scholarships about Afro-Asian print culture, with a third one mainly uh, talking about these works initiated or sustained by anti-colonial activists and publicists before or during the decolonizing movements. And while the second strand uh, regard Afro-Asian publications as part of the global uh, literary market, we try to do a little bit different here is to have the focus on the relatively uh, newly independent nation states that were jointly formed. Uh, they helped actually uh, formed a transnational, or we have that little bracket or national uh, Afro-Asian uh, print network. And there are two perspectives to this argument. And first of course is we identify a lot of frequent cross references uh, between Malian uh, newspaper Lassar and People's Daily and the official newspaper of Chinese Communist Party too. For example, Gologo's name appeared in People's Daily in March uh, 1962, and his poem, which praised Mao and other comrades uh, in founding a socialist and anti-imperialist PRC, was allegedly only uh, first published in January issue of Lesser. And later, People's Daily cited Lesser's report of Premier Zhou's visit to Mali and mentioned the article called La Chine on Berbe Géant uh, and Grand Destin, which share the same title uh, as Gologo's travelogue. Uh, as Peterson, Hunter, and Newvold, and they all both kind of look at the ideas about newspapers that propel political movements by putting desperate events together on the page and making it seem as though everyone were acting in unison. And Gologo's exact uh, contributions to Lhasa introduced China to Malian readers who were unfamiliar with it, connecting the people from the two countries to advocate socialist nation building and anti-imperialism. And the travel of these tasks back to China also contributed a heightened uh, spirit of Afro-Asian solidarity, as well as national pride. And both Malian and Chinese governments turned the press into a party organ to politically manipulate the imagination of this nation through print culture, while the cross references between these two newspapers showed an internationalist dimension in national endeavors. And cultural exchanges did not only entail political ideological agenda, but in this case also went beyond politicians and statesmen to engage a broader a readership. And the second layer of course about this an initiative is to examine the print network uh, that was both under Beijing's control and the liaisons among leftists beyond the delineation of ideological blocks. And for example, in this case, other than People's Daily, Gologo's work also appeared in other magazines and publications within China. And uh, he, for example, published a, a, a poem uh, on the World Literature Journal and even briefly mentioned the freshly out French version of his travelogue. And World Literature, this particular journal, is a monthly magazine that uh, offered rare opportunities for Chinese readers to assess newly translated foreign literature. And later on in the 64 issue, his poem to the youth was also published shortly after the release of the joint communique between the PRC and Mali. And the timing we think is quite important because it showed that it fit into the conceptualization of translation as an event and the definition of translation as an act of inclusion and exclusion, which takes place on a textual, diplomatic and epistemological level. Textual travels across regions and languages were linked with diplomacy and the search for alternative epistemological universality. Yeah, the textual travel in different print networks also revealed some of the different strategies uh, of editing and targeted uh, readers. For example, Galogo's praise poem of Mao in 1962 
fully appeared in the Mandarin version of Feng Zhidan's travelogue as a sign of Mali China true friendship published by the World Affairs Press. Feng also recounted his encounter with the French version of Mouse Works in a bookstore uh, in Bamoko, which he took as the so-called deep exchanges of Mali and Chinese people's uh, friendship. However, the whole section entitled True Friendship disappeared from glimpses into West Africa, the English version of the Feng's uh, travelogue. And it was published by Foreign Language Press, which belonged to China's Foreign Languages Publication and Distribution Administration. And different from the World Affairs Press, which was under the PRC's ministry, uh, ministry of Foreign Affairs and aimed to translate foreign texts into Chinese, Foreign Language Press targeted the overseas market and strove to present a favorable image of China to the world. So there's a differences of emphasis in these two uh, publishing house. Yet when targeting the Anglophone readers, the editors also uh, kind of delayed the poem and focused instead on the Chinese witness changes uh, in African uh, countries. And this editing sought to boast Africa's endeavors in anti-colonialism and nation building. And again, the different treatments of poem clearly demonstrate China's propaganda mechanism when addressing internal and external readership. It also, in a way, that casts doubts over the credibility of the narratives in the Mandarin version too. There's other uh, points that we have we want to mention is that it doesn't mean that these networks uh, were not uh, under, uh, you know, control of China, but you know, in a way that uh, delineate uh, another print network closely associated with the control of Beijing. For example, Gologos Anthology under the same title. Uh, uh, the poem Tornado, a uh, Dafhik, was published in Mandarin in Shanghai, and then one year before the AWB published the French version. And we want to say that the poem also featured uh, in the report of AW General Secretary uh, Ratna Senenayake. So he was at the time held quite an important role uh, in his country too, and played uh, you know, that role, in particular, his connections uh, with Beijing and to facilitate uh, the publication. And these threads point to, again, the possible future research of multi-sided and multilingual materials beyond the English archives. But this is something we have to explore further uh, in, in the future. And very briefly about the aftermath of legacy, because I'm aware of the time, uh, that we want to talk about what happened after these tasks were published, right? Uh, very uh, 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 sadly, a lot of things, uh, initiatives and cultural exchange did not really uh, sustain after uh, uh, their, 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 their death, for example, and their disappearance, for example, from the political scene. And this particular was a curator uh, that went, uh, uh, that, that broke out uh, quite in a sudden, that uh, threw away uh, medieval kaita. And then Gologo, uh, as a result of that, uh, did, not, did not know that what would happen uh, during his last visit to China too. And he commented at the time, the last travel in China about cultural revolution, and then that work got published in People's Daily again, and then he praised uh, Mao again uh, to, uh, to the metaphor, like in the metaphor of Red Sun and so on. And his writing was the only notable piece published uh, in the 67 uh, issue. But this again was quite a romanticized view of the revolution because we all know what happened afterwards. The publication circulations of Glogo's works were embedded in a network of visibility outside both the Soviet bloc and Western book markets. And it subsided on several intersecting platforms organized by various Afro Asian uh, uh, organizations. And then his works traveled from Bamako to Jakarta, from Moscow to Paris, from Beijing to Colombo. And his crossings from poet to politician, from newspaper editor to reporter and commentator were all travels or conference uh, hopping that took place on an elitist level. And crossings of his poem from French to Mandarin and from lesser to world literature show the eventfulness of these activities funded by governments and greatly influenced by internal and external power struggles. And of course, after the launch of the Cultural Revolution, Many previously mentioned Chinese writers suffered in this political upheaval. And after the Kureira, um, Gologo himself was in prison too, and his Chinese in, uh, counterparts were no luckier. Han Beiping passed away at the age of only uh, 56 as a result of sufferings during the destructive Cultural Revolution in 1970. 
and uh, there are lots of praise about his work later on. But what is left from this so-called short-lived? romantic uh, internationalist or nationalist movement remains between the pages of those texts, a sentimental residue of an ongoing project of the so-called uh, third world. So to conclude, we have regarded historical, uh, I mean, we have regarded these travelogues as both historical archives and literary writing to understand these sort of lived experiences and firsthand accounts. They actually helped unveil the embodiment of Afro-Asian networks after the Bandung Conference. And the essay actually sheds light on the uh, cross uh, crossings of individuals, texts, and circulation networks as special mediums of third world cosmopolitanism that go beyond national boundaries and the Cold War uh, binary. Again, the third world crossings provide a different frame of reference through which to understand the travels, as well as the travel writings of Africans outside the Africa West paradigm. And reading the travelogues uh, in that way that helps ha helps uh, prepare for rethinking, probably of a contemporary uh, China-Africa relations. What is the relevance of reading these texts today and when more complex uh, crossings are, are taking place? So we actually try to build up that kind of uh, connection to see if there's sort of uh, interesting episodes or legacies that we need to reflect on. And there are other debates, on, ongoing debates about conceptual understanding of these interactions as whether it's global south uh, in a way that has re gradually replaced the term third world. Can we still use third world again? Or on the other hand, some people ask whether Africa in the global north, uh, global south, sorry, anyway. And these are all the kind of bigger questions we, 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 we try to ask ourselves, but also uh, probably to uh, discuss later with uh, our, our peers. And there's some further thoughts about this project. We hope that it's not an ending point of it. And we try to take advantage of other uh, existing works uh, that we have collected over uh, the pro, I mean, in the process of preparing for this draft essay. We have collected so far 49. Uh, uh, African literature and the travelogues publish uh, works in, uh, in China. And uh, just example about some of the covers, uh, and you can see they got translated from different types of languages. In this case, also from, from Russian as well. And we like to include a bit more in terms of visual representation and to use uh, book covers or some other kind of photos example, as well as to see the kind of translation and uh, circulation. Uh, for example, the kind of uh, comparative lens between communist China and, 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 and Soviet Union at the time. But we need help. We, none of us know Russian, so we need help to identify these original works and then to trace the uh, kind of translating process, but also these people who are actively involved uh, in, uh, in, in this kind of 